Gracious Heavenly Father, as we move into the area of thanksgiving in our study, for all that you've done for us in Christ, I just thank you for granting us the opportunity to feast together upon the truth of your word, to know you uh, who is life eternal. We praise you for all that you've done for us. Please, dear Lord, open our eyes and our hearts to that which is true, that we together might grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Today's November the 7th, 2019, and we're going together through the epistle to the Colossians verse by verse, and in our last study together, we were at the sixth verse of the second chapter, Galatians chapter 2, verse 6. We're about to enter into, I believe, some very precious headlines given to us by the heart of our God. A great percentage of modern preaching centers around human responsibility, and if you follow these studies, you know that I am not in any way opposed to human responsibility. But my great desire is that we understand that our service for Christ is based entirely upon our understanding who Christ is and what he did for us. And I guess you could expand that to say what he's done, is doing, and will do. When the great emphasis is on human responsibility, then well, then it's an easy step to to just conclude that our service for God is necessary uh, in order for us to receive some blessing or some position, some standing before God. When what our text is clearly going to reveal here is that we serve because of what Christ did, not so that God will somehow, you know, apply what Christ did to our lives, you know, just make that effectual in our lives which places us at the forefront of all of this, when Christ should be at the forefront of all of this. When the tiniest move in that direction is a move away from the grace of God, God did not reconcile us on the basis of, of our work, on the basis of our service, on the basis of our belief, our faith, or anything else. He reconciled us in Christ Jesus. Oh, but Steve, you know, you don't know what I did. No, and I, I don't want to know. You know, you know, if you just hadn't done this or that or the other thing, you know, God is not imputing your trespasses against you, folks. He's not your enemy. He loves you. He's your heavenly father. In the 28th verse of the first chapter, admonishing every man and, and instructing every man in all wisdom that we might present every man complete or mature in Christ. And here we are, chapter 2, and chapter 2 is the heart, it's the outline, it's the thesis of that admonishing and that instruction. I am firmly committed. The Holy Spirit didn't expect us to forget all the rest of Colossians and then just stop at verse 28 of chapter 1 and then start just start admonishing one another on how we ought to live how do we how we ought to stop doing this and start doing this and and all that stuff that is not the heart of the admonishing here we're not there yet at the moment the holy spirit's instruction to us is in the completeness of the work of of Christ Jesus. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. If you believe at some point you evaluated your life and, and in the muck and the mire of your life you decided that you were headed toward hell and you could either continue on your way to hell or or you could just you know grab yourself by the nap of the neck and say, well I need a savior so I'm going to choose this religion uh, over another and so you know you chose christianity you chose christ and so now you're headed for heaven if if you believe that then your belief 
uh, Christ, you know, you believe basically that Christ just stood idly by hoping that you'd make the right decision and set the precedent, you know, the uh, precedent for a walk which followed, you know, a thinking and a walk that was based on human merit, human logic, human reasoning. It all began with you, so it continues with you. If, on the other hand, you accept the statement of the Word of God that you received Christ Jesus the Lord as a gift before you were ever born, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, that you were crucified with him, Romans chapter 6, that when Christ died, you died with him. When he was buried, you were buried with him. And when he rose, you rose from the dead with him and, and never knew it that it was by the grace of God and the work of the Holy Spirit that he revealed to you that you belong to him, that this is how you received Christ Jesus the Lord, based, you know, based on what he did, not what you did, that you received him because God gave him to you before the foundation of the world, before you ever thought of asking him to, not because you asked, not because you accepted or believed, but because God put you in Christ, that God gave Christ to be the head over the church, and therefore now in the same way, this is how you are to walk, recognizing that God is behind our walk just as God was behind our receiving, and that that walk, in fact, came from the hand of the Almighty God. Without any question in my mind, that must change the way I walk. I received Christ because of what Christ did, and I walk in him because of what Christ did. I don't know how to say it any simpler than that. And most people I talk to, they, they either, they don't have enough money, or you know, you got too much money, or you don't have the right wife, you don't have the right kids, the right job, the right house, the right health, you know, who knows what. Somehow or other, we make the Word of God a handbook for modern living that will, you know, in fact, be useless once we die. You know, that God gave all of the Word of God just so that we would know how to live the, the scant few years that we have in this life, which is really but just a scratch of eternity compared to our eternal existence and fellowship with Christ. You know, compared to eternity, our time here is absolutely nothing. And to suggest that this book was written only that we might know how to live the few pitiful years that we have here is to rob it of most of its glory and its power. I have no idea why God has placed you where you are. But I do believe that you are where you are. You are what you are. You're even in the mess that you're in. Because of a loving Heavenly Father who graciously gave you that walk. Can I honestly reach that conclusion? So walk ye in Him. How? Verse 7 tells us. And my heart rejoices, folks, in the fact that I'm rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith as I have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Now, I've, I've, I've told you, I don't, I mean, I don't believe any verse is any more important than another, but I do want to say that there are passages of scripture that cause me to humble myself before God and stand in pure amazement. And then, and this here is one of those verses. So we're going to take a hard look at this. The word rooted is a perfect passive participle. This says that being a participle, its action in the perfect tense precedes the action of the main verb. So whatever we're looking at in this first word is, first of all, a perfect tense. It's completely done. And I, I know it's jumping ahead here a bit, but, you know, forgive me, but I can't resist. What we will see here is three things that God did passive voice, and one thing that we do, active voice, the thing that we do being, uh, at the end of, of, of the verse, the thing that we do being based upon the preceding things, the three things that God did, 
We are abounding in thanksgiving because of our being rooted and being built up and established in the faith. It doesn't say that God will do these these three things if we do something. I mean, you know, just the fact that our act of, of thanksgiving is placed at the end of the sentence should be enough to tell us that. You know, like you know, like like I want to I want to give thanks for the fact that I uh, that I've done these things so that uh, you know you know God will do the you know it just doesn't make sense, folks. It's done, and we have been asked by the author, the Holy Spirit, to look at the reality of what has been done. In the Greek, if I put something in the perfect tense, I'm asking you to look at the present reality of a past fact or a past act, the complete result of something that happened way back then. It's completely done in the past. And the word means rooted, means secure. Unbelievable, you know, to me how effective Satan's ministry is. Children of God who are not fully confident of their security in Christ. The word rooted means secure. And as a, pa a perfect passive, I translate this, having been placed on a solid and firm foundation so that we are now looking at the result of our, of our being placed on such a foundation. We, in past time, were securely fastened to a foundation. And God is asking us to look at the present reality of that action. I'm suggesting to you that action was the finished work of Jesus Christ. And there's, there's no possibility of synergism here. No cooperation between you and God in your walk, whatever it is, and, and how uh, dissatisfied or satisfied that you may be with it. The first consideration in that walk is that God has securely fashioned you to a solid foundation and God did it. You didn't do it. You know, I mean, if you can slip from that saddle, pardon the you know, expression, then he did a poor job of cinching it tight. If there is any way that you can be moved from that foundation, then the fault lies with God. The verb is built up. And the participle says that you were firmly secure to the foundation before he started to build you up. And that's probably a pretty good thing. You know, I mean, I, I suppose you could build a, you know, a house from the top down. You know, I suppose it could be done, but normally we lay a firm foundation and then we, we build upon it. And that's what God did. And so the participle says that you were secured before you were being built up. But before that, God wants you to know that you are secure. Now, I've mentioned this on several occasions. At the first Passover, the firstborn son, didn't he didn't place the blood over the doorpost and the lentils. It was the father who did that. The firstborn son, he didn't need to believe in the blood. It was the father who sacrificed. It was the father who applied the blood. And it was the father who was faithful, not the son. The son could go to bed and, and worry all night long that he was going to die, but he would wake up alive because of, the, of what his father did. Kid could go to bed, sleep perfectly, absolutely sleep like a baby. I'm not going to die. My dad said I wasn't, and he wakes up dead. It didn't matter what the son believed. What mattered was what his father did, and... and and what did that first Passover represent? The Lamb of God sacrificed for us. Oh, dearly beloved, the faithfulness involved is the faithfulness of your loving Heavenly Father and being built up in Him. The word being built up is in the present tense. We're looking at a continuing action. But the passive voice is, I am not building myself up. Okay? Okay. You saw that in Ephesians. The body is Christ. The building fitly framed together is built by God. A, a building fitly framed together by God. Here we have the ex exact same truth. You know, when the, when the business failed, 
Uh, God was building you up in him. When the child died, God was building you up in him. When you were sick, when you were hurt, when things didn't go right, when you were you when you you had hit rock bottom and you were in deep despair, God was building you up in him. And the beautiful thing is God told us this. Okay, for you to get to heaven and find out that you went down a path that to you appeared to be very difficult and that God was using that path to build you up in him. You will not be able to say to God at that time, well, God, if you had just told me that God is telling you that right here. That's what he told us. Steve, you're secure Son, I love you. I have placed you securely on a foundation which can't be moved, and I'm building you up. That's what I'm doing in your life. It may not always appear that to be the case, but that's what I'm doing. And if that be true, and it is true, then God can do with me as he, as he wills, as he pleases. What could I put beside the finished work of Jesus Christ? He's building me up in him. That's what the text says. That's what he's doing. And I'm surrounded by people that hate their life, hate their job, hate their work, hate their spouse, hate, hate everything. You know, when hate what they've done in the past, even, you know, when regret, folks, is, well, boy, that's a tough one, I know, but regret is the very heart of atheism. God has always been working in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure. He's never allowed anything to touch your life except it be for your ultimate good. He never touches you except in love. And he's always done that. He did it in the life of Paul before Paul's Damascus Road experience. Same is true in us, in our lives. You know, we all have to some extent, you know, a, a, a horrid past. And yet God works in perfection. What I do is not very perfect, but what God does is perfect. Do you have any idea what a difference it makes in your walk day after day if you can say that he's building you up in him? Do you realize how many excuses the devil will give you? Well, yeah, you know, I know that verse is true if, if, you, if you try, but... You know, but boy, that old truck of mine, you know, it went into a ditch because I didn't drive right. It wasn't God building me up. It was one of them stupid mistakes that I made. And you guys will all come up with stuff like that. I know I have. You've got all those kinds of reasonings. Listen, everything that you do is stupid outside of Christ. The good thing is that God is building you up and you'll try to come up with a thousand reasons why this verse would be true if... Well, you, you know, you were Moses or, or Daniel or Paul or, well, or even King David. And, you know, folks, are you really going to sit there and say, well, Steve, God would like to build me up in him. You know, he, he would, he really would. God's trying to do it, but, but I always get in the way. You say that. And you've classed yourself with the majority of Christians who, for some reason or another, believe that they're stronger than God. My text tells me without any of the issues you may desire to, to force into that text that God has fastened you securely and God is building you up in Christ. There's no question about it. But let's go on and establish in the faith. And I can lay out 10 commentaries where he, he, every one of them says established in your faith. And folks, it does not say established in your faith. It says established in the faith. It's articulated. The word established there is a present tense. That's the result, the continuing result of what God is doing in your life. And he is establishing you are not and he's establishing you in the faith. And I'm a strong believer that this is the faithfulness of God. If he's not faithful, I'm not very securely fastened. If he's not faithful, I'm not built up very well. You know, kind of like a shed I once built where the roof leaked. And one of the, the corners was a little crooked. 
On the other hand, if God does a good job, and I believe he does, I am being established in his faithfulness. In the sphere of the faithfulness of God. God is faithful, even when you're not. So I have three passives. He firmly fastened me to a solid foundation, a rock which can't be moved. The rock being Christ, not not Peter. You know, whoever, whoever every student of the Greek knows was a pebble. You, Peter, are a little pebble, but upon the marvelous, immovable rock, the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. God is building me up in him, and God is making me permanent in the faithfulness of Christ. He is strengthening me in the faithfulness of Christ, is what our text says. And every action so far in my walk has been an action undertaken by God Almighty. I have been the passive recipient of these actions. And now, now, I suddenly have an active. I don't understand why most of Christianity wants to put all the actives in there. You know, you ought to do this and you ought to do that and you ought to do the other thing. And then you'll get a reward. Now you're in the in the danger of going to hell and everybody leaves church insecure. Those who are outside of Christ, they walk insecure. We don't. My, mine and your walk is permanent and secure. God is working in our life. The problem is it isn't always the kind of walk that we want. But what's my responsibility in this walk? I come now to this first active verb, abounding in thanksgiving. My Bible says abounding therein with thanksgiving. You can cross out the, if you've got the authorized version, you can cross out the, the uh, cross out the uh, therein with. It's not there in the original text. Abounding in thanksgiving is what the Greek says. That's my responsibility. That's a present active. That means that all the time I am abounding in thanksgiving. Always. Why? Because of the three path passives that just preceded this in verse 7. That is my responsibility in my walk. More than service, more than production is thanksgiving. And if it's really thanksgiving, it has to be based on the three passives that preceded it. How can I give thanks in all things and give thanks for all things? If I don't recognize the sovereign, majestic power of my loving Heavenly Father, I can't give thanks in all things and for all things. If you don't recognize the relationship between you and God, which has been clearly outlined in, in right here in three little passive verbs in this verse, you will never comprehend true thanksgiving. But if you can grasp the reality of what has preceded this thanksgiving, then folks, you can easily abound in thanksgiving. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Thank you for watching.